Happy New Year, and welcome to the first Must See Monday of 2019. My name is Rita Hill, and I'm the director of the New Media Innovation and Entrepreneurship Lab. And um, tonight, I have a panel of uh, former students, uh, some uh, from a year or so ago, and, and, and or one from a year or so ago, and, and a few others who were in the lab last semester. And we're going to be talking about uh, new tools uh, to tell journalism. You know, I, I think a lot of you, how many of you are, are uh, freshmen? Okay, any sophomores in the house? Any grad students? Yeah, there you go. Well, um, especially for you freshmen, you've been here now for um, you know a semester, and you might be thinking, well, is it all broadcast? Is it all print? Is it all social media? What else is out there? And I think when um, we think about virtual tools for real news, we know that there's a lot of new emerging technology that is available to us now that we can tell stories so many ways, from virtual reality to news games to augmented reality to uh, just so many ways that we can convey that news to people. Why is it important? It's important because we have you know, 75 million young people, you know, Gen Z, millennials, whose first instinct is not to pick up a newspaper or even turn on the broadcast news when something breaking has happened. Not that they won't, but it's just not that first instinct. So it's important for us as journalists that we have all kinds of ways to reach people and to give people the news and information that they really need. Um, so, very briefly, I just want to introduce my panel. Um, we have uh, Nicole, who was in the lab back in fall of 2017. And she did a wonderful project that we'll be talking about in a little bit. And then we have Atana, who was in the lab just this past semester, along with Case and TJ. Uh, they were, all three of them were in the lab this past semester. So what I do in my method is to look at some of the new technology that's out there, try to figure out, is the time right to use that new technology for journalism? A lot of the new tools that are out there are um, formulated, I think, by people in software and adopted first by gamers. Nothing wrong with that. Any gamers in the house, people who like to play console games, PC games, uh, mobile casual games, they're fun. But a lot of times gamers will get the new technology like virtual reality or augmented reality and they're doing a lot of fun stuff with it. Um, they kind of figure out the tools, they influence the content management system and all of that. But what I always think about is can we take those tools and use that for storytelling, for journalism, for more serious news or for more feature news? And most of the time we can. Um, we just have to, you know, flip the, the script a little bit, um, look at it from a more innovative standpoint and go for it. And every semester I have super bright students who come into the lab who are willing to just experiment. You know, throw them into the deep end of the ocean and just like, okay, let's swim back to shore and see what happens. I always tell the students that they can't fail because something that they tried didn't work. They can only fail or not succeed if they didn't try hard enough or they didn't try to um, carry out the plans and what they intended to do. I mean, it's easy to kind of sit back and go, oh, well, this is too new, it doesn't work. But what I found is that these students are always willing to push the envelope and do, um, uh, just take it to the wall as much as they can. And it's amazing what they're able to accomplish in about 16 short weeks. So I'm going to walk through some of the things that we're working on, that we have worked on, and I'm going to let these students kind of explain a little bit about their thought processes when they were doing news games, when they were working with uh, virtual reality, uh, and working with augmented reality. And um, then we'll take some questions. All right. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, again, um, I mentioned news games, gaming the news. Games have been around for a long time since the you know dawn of mankind. But um, what journalists, I think, in the last 15 years have, have discovered is that games help 
people, audiences retain information. And if you go to the next slide, um, I wanted to show, to, to talk about research that shows that people remember more when they can interact with the content. If I tell you something, you might remember it. If I show you something, you might remember it a little bit more. But if you get your hands on it and you're interacting with that content and that information, you're going to uh, remember it for a lot longer. And games can help you do that. Um, there's a game that I'm working on now. Um, this is a horrible picture, and I didn't realize that it, it came out so blurry. But it's a fake news game that I'm building for the News Collab. And it's all about how fake news can um, spread across the country and how bad actors can take news, fake it up, and then target different demographics in order to twist um, you know, their, their knowledge of something or to give them a different perspective. And you know, it's all in the news, how the Russians may have interfered or did interfere with our elections. And, but we're also hearing that some of the liberal groups have done the same things, like down in Alabama, using fake news to dissuade people from voting or to um, move their vote to another candidate or uh, to turn against a candidate. It's very effective because they understand games, and journalists really need to understand games. But here's a game. It's uh, called DUI Drive. And this is a game that Nicole worked on uh, back in fall of 2017. And um, why don't you tell them a little bit about the game, what you want it to do, and what you think you accomplished. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole. It's great to be here tonight. So in fall 2017, we had been working on news games. And we were put into a group, and we had to come up with a game that would teach a lesson, that would show someone a solution to something, in a way. So me and my group sat down, and we had been working a lot with car games. And we had a lot of code for car games, and we were like, well, how can we make a car game that will teach someone a lesson? So we thought of DUI Drive. And the biggest complication with this game is the ethical issue. We had to come up with a way to teach people not to drive drunk in a game where you were driving drunk. So um, what we came up with is an unwinnable game. You tried to sober up throughout the game, drinking water and such. Um, and you could get drunker if you accidentally hit a beer bottle. But in the end, no matter how sober you could get, you never were able to sober up enough, and you always lost the game. So uh, looking back now, I'm sure there are things we would have changed, but at the time, this was the best way we could think to utilize our um, codes that we currently had. Um, Did you have any experience in, in game building before or um, developing games? Not at all. Um, I actually found a passion for technology through this. I had never coded before, and I never thought I would be able to. It seemed like a whole nother language, and it is. It's a whole nother language. But after looking at it for the first time, I realized this was something I could do. And I started looking at ways I could learn more about technology. And I found a program at ASU called Social Tech. And I am now a master's student in the Social Tech program. So uh, it just shows you, even if you don't think you can do something, you probably have a talent. You just have to give it a shot. And before that, what were you planning to do? Were you planning to get a master's in journalism, public relations, or what were you thinking about before? I um, really didn't the lab? know. Okay. I, when you come into the lab, it's a great opportunity to learn a lot about yourself. I, I was in Cronkite for the public relations mm -hmm. degree, and that opened a lot of doors for me. But by going into the lab, I learned that I had talent where I didn't even think I had a talent, where I didn't even think I would know how to learn how to code or work with technology. Um, but through that, I found a way to further my education in tech. Great. Excellent. And what do you hope to do with this degree when you, I mean, what would be your dream job? Well, I had a great internship last summer with Delta Airlines. Okay. And I was in the corporate communications department working with news. I did internal and external news. But while I was there, I found, um, I was introduced to a department through Delta called The Hangar. It was a division that we referred to as The Hangar. And essentially, it was completely devoted to innovation. 
It's a career where you can think creatively and turn, turn and just work on coming up with innovations. Um, so I thought that might be a great way. Um, wherever I end up, I really hope I work in aviation. Okay, great, excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. Um, so just moving on, um, 360 and virtual reality. How many of you have had an opportunity to look at 360 video? So, so 360 video is basically um, where you, you know, either look through the viewfinder of your phone or maybe you can put a, a, a viewfinder on your head, some sort of goggles. And a few years ago, everybody was really into 360 video. So I don't have a student here who worked in this particular project, but I wanted to show you a project we did a couple of years ago, kind of looking back on the Phoenix Indian School. Some of you who are new to Phoenix may have heard of Indian School Road, and it's because back in the, around the turn of the century, um, the federal government decided to put a school to educate Native Americans here in Phoenix, and um, we decided to, oh no, never mind. Um, so we <laughs> we decided to um, uh, turn this into a 360 project. Sorry about that. We'll uh, try to figure that out a little bit later on. But what we did is we went out to the current Indian school. Um, there are three of the roughly 20-some buildings still remaining. We took black and white photos there, or, or video there, and then we took old archival video and, and photographs, rather, from the 1920s and 30s, stitched those together in a 360 format so that we can show people what it was like to be on that campus back around the 1920s and 30s. Um, so that was one of the projects that we did. This is another project that we worked on about two years ago, and it was about a, a young woman who um, got sent up 25 to life for soliciting, the charge was soliciting murder of uh, a rival. You know, her, she thought her husband was having an affair with someone, and she got in trouble. But what we did is we rebuilt the jail cell that she's in, the prison cell that she's been in for the last 14, 15 years, and we told her story. So hopefully this one will, will work. Okay. All right. Um, and, and these are all on YouTube. I can send the link out later. But um, with, with this one, if, it should be a YouTube uh, link, and what it'll show you is what it's like to be in this prison cell. We even have the details down to the dinner that they give them every night, which is a sandwich, I think an apple, and something else. They can only have four books in their, their prison cell. They can have a bulletin board. And it was through this bulletin board with the pictures of this woman's family, daughter, um, her previous life, that we kind of told the story of what happened to her. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get that one up. So that should, I'm sorry? Okay, all right, well, it, it, the link was working. I tested it earlier today, but um, no problem. Um, we'll just keep, we'll just move on. So with that particular um, project, we really wanted to give people the sense of being inside of a prison cell and all the challenges that, you know, two women being inside of a claustrophobic space. And the reason we know why that prison cell looks the way it looks is because these two women, or the, the woman, the subject of this uh, documentary, is actually next door to Jody Arias' uh, uh, prison cell. So we've had plenty of pictures and video uh, of Jody Arias, and we were able to fashion uh, the prison cell that these women were in, um, down to the dirt on the walls, you know, just everything that's uh, a part of it here. Okay, is that playing? Do you hear any sound? And so we tried to give people statistics on um, the war against uh, drugs and the war on crime and how people can kind of get caught up in it. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that so many women uh, are being sent to prison and it's one of the uh, fastest growing populations of, of prisoners in the United States. And if you kind of fast forward um, ahead a little bit, I think you'll be able to hear 
the story. This is Melinda Illum's uh, story. And those of us who were beginners kind of asked her often for help when we, when we ran into trouble. She married this guy, and uh, he had been in, in prison, was out of prison, and he was holding down a job. And Melinda was just head over heels in love with him. They had a, a baby, Amina. Once my daughter was born, it got more stressful because he would never be home. And then I found out that he was cheating on me again with his baby's mother. And I was talking to this crackhead that he was dealing to, and she was like, well, we should get her. I was crying and upset, and then we started just talking about it. My plan was just to have him beat her up, punch her in the stomach because she was pregnant. What I thought was what was his son. When she got home, she called the Tucson Police Department and then she called me again and I'm like, oh my God, what? She's like, well, I don't want to do it. I have some, some guy that'll do it for you. I met him at um, in a parking lot and gave him some drugs. And, and as a result of that encounter, she was, it was a setup, she was, was she was arrested and um, sentenced to this huge prison uh, sentence. And even though the, the parole board voted to let her out, um, uh, Governor Brewer at the time vetoed that, so she's still in prison. So again, we're showing you that the same gaming technology that people use to create uh, video games, you can use to recreate uh, events in virtual reality and can um, really bring people into a story in a way that sometimes you can't. The two women who worked on this, they went down to the prison, they interviewed uh, uh, Melinda, they interviewed all these other people, and they did a really great job. Um, so that's kind of 360 and virtual reality. The next thing I want to talk to you about is augmented reality. Now, how many of you have experimented with augmented reality? All right, what have you, what are some of the things that you, you've done? Uh, there was like a, like a blue planet app that was like the civilization you know, you just like scroll through the globe and like the Okay, great, yeah. I mean, it's so much, uh, any of you played Pokemon Go? when it was out and cool. Yeah, I know, you're probably like in middle school when that happened, but. Um, so augmented reality has been around for a long time. I did my first augmented reality app back in 2010, but in the last two years, Apple, um, Google, and Android, um, so many companies have been pouring lots and lots of money into augmented reality. And kind of the beauty of augmented reality is that um, it's on the uh, one billion mobile devices, whether it's your smartphone, whether it's a tablet, um, whether it's an uh, iPhone or Android phone, Google Pixel, you can get to it. So what a lot of people are doing with augmented reality right now is either they're playing games or they're putting you know little um, emojis or they're you know putting uh, filters onto their friends' uh, faces through Snap or Instagram, things like that. But what we looked at last semester was how can we use augmented reality for storytelling? Can you create a world in augmented reality that all you have to do is look through your phone, project it out, and you have a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end? And I wanted to show you a couple of those, uh, the three of those projects that we worked on. So we have little video snippets to uh, kind of, one of the show you. Well, hold up. This is, this is one that the Weather Channel did that I thought was pretty awesome that I want to show you first before we get into the student work. And this is showing you how a tornado can impact a community. Now, all of this is done, except for him, in augmented reality. So if you kind of look at the, the um, screen behind him, part of it is real, and then part of it is augmented reality. So you can go ahead and show Tornadoes that. are one of the most feared and destructive forces on the planet, capable of producing catastrophic damage in a matter of seconds. And it's that trail of destruction that is used to determine the tornado's rating. It's called the Enhanced Fujita Scale, or EF Scale. And today, all the ingredients are coming together for some big storms. So Let's we take can a look skip outside. ahead just Trouble a little bit. Trouble is already brewing. We've got a tornado warning just like this one. But it's important to point out that size doesn't always equate to the intensity. Today, there's a mobile Doppler radar actually feeding back real-time wind speeds. And I, 
and I'm being told that those wind speeds are approaching about 85 miles per hour. So that's likely going to be an EF0. All right, EF0 damage here is tree branches thrown around, some roof shingles peeled back, but hold on. Let's look at this tornado. It's going from more of a rope now to a much thicker tornado, a much wider tornado. It looks more like a stovepipe now. It's called a stovepipe because it resembles one. This could produce EF1 damage, potentially. All right, 86 to 110 mile per hour winds here. Mobile homes now can be flipped or rolled, roofs severely damaged here, and there can be extensive power outages. Jeez, that was close. And, and so let's Look, stop it right here. Tornado like this, power lines are going to fall. <laughs> I love this like because this is an example of what you can do in augmented reality. Now they're blending um, the studio with AR. As you can see, the um, the power lines are falling. The um, the, the the poles. You have uh, information telling you to stay back, all of that. And this is a great video because at some point you've got you know, sports cars being flung around, you have the whole studio that's destroyed. So I remember seeing this and thinking to myself, okay, can Cronkite students do something that's cool? And um, I, I think we did. So we'll show you a little bit more of this and then we'll go on to the uh, Cronkite students' work. So just maybe a few more minutes of uh, Tornadoes are one of the most just feared through. This house are a few interior Look at rooms, that. all right? The safest place in this house is the central bathroom. This is the lowest level that you should be in if you don't have a shelter that is below ground. Put as many walls between you and the outside that you can. And remember, when you go to take cover, grab a helmet, grab a sturdy pair of shoes, because you have to walk outside after the tornado, and that presents all kinds of new hazards. Clearly, an EF3 is life-threatening. Thank goodness less than 1% of all tornadoes in the U.S. are classified higher. I mean, when you, when you think is, about normal exactly weather and you look at this type of reporting, I mean, it's just no comparison if you can, if you can do this on a regular basis. I mean, look at the funnel. Okay. You can't even see it from edge to edge. This type of tornado is pulverizing everything in its path. Huge, heavy objects thrown into the air and carried several hundred feet. Oh, jeez, you've got to be kidding me. Look at this. This beat up 3,000 pound car. It was lofted by the tornado and tossed Yeah, around. pretty amazing. So my question was, well, what could we teach Cronkite students how to do this? Can they figure out how to do something almost as awesome? And I think they did it. So the next thing I wanted to uh, uh, show you, again, we talked about Pokemon Go. We talked about these filters that people are putting on their faces. But what, how can journalists tell stories in augmented reality? So the first one I wanted to talk to you about is um, a project that Atana worked on with her team, and I wanted her to just kind of walk through it. But let's just show a little bit of that clip. Hopefully we can get that going. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, when you're embedding uh, video, it's always interesting. But again, this should be YouTube. Yeah, if you, no, it's on, it's on YouTube. So it's, uh, if you go to the New Media Innovation Lab page, you should be able to find it. Um, so why don't, um, Atana, why don't you start talking about what your thought process was, what you were trying to accomplish, and then I'm going to sneak back and see if I can help out. Okay. Well, for one thing, there was, oh, nice, song. hello. Yeah, they, oh. <laughs> um, this process started, um, so the name of our augmented reality project was called This Is Not Voodoo. Um, originally it started um, when our team, Studio Vanta, um, we wanted to document the Salem witch trials. Um, it was, we had a couple history buffs on our team and they wanted to revisit this part of history that was already talked about a lot in media. Um, one show specifically, American Horror Story, um, and how they went back and 
kind of like showed this piece of history, this piece of American history in a new light. And we wanted to do the same thing with augmented reality. However, the more that we looked into it, we realized that um, there were some facts that were you know, plastered all over the internet that were not actually true, specifically about Tichuba. And if anyone's ever read The Crucible in like high school, um, Tichuba was uh, apparently a black slave that was practicing voodoo, and that was the reason why um, it spread. And so we actually just focus more on voodoo and their story instead. And she's showing how you would access this content just using your phone. When Columbus landed in North America, Spain was insistent on taking colonies, including what would become known as Haiti. To learn more, click the icon on the bottom left of the screen. began as a trading camp for French traders in the early 1700s. The city has been at the center of many historical events including the War of 1812, the Civil Rights Movement, and Hurricane Katrina. Voodoo first came to New Orleans through slaves who were brought in during the French colonial period. From there, the city of New Orleans became associated with voodoo, both authentic and commodified. To learn more, click the icon on the bottom left of the screen. Stop it. One of the things I thought was really interesting about this project is, you know, Unity and uh, game design designers have a lot of 3D elements that you can pull into your project when you're creating. So if you need a, if you need a sports car, if you need a zombie, if you need a dinosaur, there's plenty of that stuff. But doing something historical was a challenge for you, correct? It was. Um, for, so we did three layers um, of history, of the history of voodoo, so Haiti, um, Salem Witch Trials, and then uh, modern-day New Orleans. To get all of the 3D models um, that are needed, we would go to um, free assets. We would try to get free assets as much as we could. Or we'd go to Turbo Squid and buy some. However, a lot of them were made for games, specifically for games. So when we looked for realistic um, witches, uh, they were the ones with like pointy hats and green faces, and we couldn't put that in a very like accurate depiction of Salem. So we actually had to um, model stuff ourselves through Blender, and we also had um, help from um, Michael, uh, who came in. He was really good and really good at creating things through Unity. So, like the pilgrims scene in Salem were actually handmade, and um, those are just kind of like the challenges that come with creating something like this when you're trying to be as accurate to history as possible. Um, being able to accurately show things that happen through history without it being kitschy, without it being cartoonish. Um, and something that we really focused on, especially with Haiti, was um, giving our assets or placing them in a way that respected the culture in which we were trying to show. Um, if journalism is going towards this direction of showing things and recreating scenes um, so accurately, it's important not to remake the same mistakes that history has already made with, especially with um, practitioners of voodoo and African spiritualism. 
Great, great. And and then um, thank you. And, and we'll we can answer questions a little bit later. The next one I wanted to show you is something completely different. Um, so we went in a completely different uh, uh, direction, uh, talking about a modern problem. Uh, in case um, we'll kind of talk through the project that he did. Let's see if this one will come up. My linking was obviously really bad today, but I tested all of these. Um, so, Kay, start talking a little bit about the project that you guys worked on. I have no idea what happened. Um, so, our project was the Mexican Grey Wolf Adventure. Um, our original inspiration was a series that Cronkite News had done, I believe it was last year, uh, highlighting the Mexican Grey Wolf and its um, interaction with uh, both human and livestock throughout rural Arizona and how that interaction really uh, is detrimental to both their uh, species ability to survive and the individual uh, ability to survive. Um, what we really wanted to accomplish with our app was both an educational tool and something that was Arizona specific. Um, when we did some basic research, we saw that uh, state fish and wildlife agency had already uh, been working in local classrooms, uh, educating kids generally uh, fourth to seventh grade level, so not like super very detailed uh, biological information, but more base level. Um, here's a Mexican gray wolf, its habitat, um, the amount of uh, members of its species, uh, what its threats are. Um, and Attempts that's really have been made by previous administrations to remove the protections of the Mexican gray wolves roaming Arizona and New Mexico. These proposals have spoken to the larger issues of their status as a species. In 1976, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services first listed the Mexican gray wolf as a protected species under the Endangered Species Act. There are over 300 Mexican gray wolves in captivity around the world, but there are only 113 in the wild as of August 2, 2018. Residing in the Apache National Forest in southeastern Arizona, the Mexican gray wolves have suffered habitat loss and other human impacts so great that they have been effectively absent from the American landscape for more than half a century. The release of these wolves back into the wilderness began in Arizona in 1998, and the population has risen from four wolves to 63. This endangered species is unique because instead of habitat restoration being the main obstacle in conservation efforts, the wolves and the ones fighting for them need to overcome social tolerance. In order for the Mexican gray wolf to qualify for protection under the Endangered Species Act, the committee must determine if their taxonomy is markedly separated from the same taxon, such as its family, class, or species. On August 2nd, a Mexican gray wolf was killed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture following an investigation into the deaths of four cattle in Apache County. A Fish and Wildlife Service memo justifying the lethal control of the wolf found one calf had been killed by wolves, one was probably killed by wolves, and a third cow died of natural causes on August 2nd. The death of another calf found a day later was attributed to wolf depredation. And in case when you think of a, a a story like this, if you were trying to get 15 year olds to you know pay attention to the Mexican gray wolves, you know. It, by conventional means or by this, I mean, talk about the difference. So actually one of our group mates, her sister was a teacher in Arizona public schools. So when we were demoing uh, early versions of the app, we asked her to bring into the classrooms. And what she found um, on a very anecdotal lo level was that these kids who really were just reading information, regurgitating information, this platform allowed it to be slightly more digestible and uh, slightly more engaging. And especially with this being an educational tool that we'd like to, um, in an ideal world, spread out to other endangered species um, in Arizona, um, uh, using engaging uh, technology like this, and that's really the, the purpose behind AR as an educational tool, is making it a more engaging medium. Um, allowed allow the younger user to pick up information that they maybe not 
wouldn't uh, get in a large series like Cronkite News, which is a much more difficult thing to get into. Mm -hmm. Much more traditional. Yes. Yeah, traditional. Right. Um, and the last one I wanted to show you, um, it's, it's also historical, but it's a little bit more uh, contemporary. And we, um, the students, TJ and his team, really wanted to work on LGBTQ plus rights and, and that movement. A lot of people um, might know of marriage equality, but they don't know all the background and how uh, that civil rights movement evolved over time. So um, let's uh, talk a little bit about your practice project and then we'll show a clip. Uh, yeah, sure. So basically it was an AR project. Um, has about five different important locations in LGBT history around the U.S. And each one, this project took a little bit of a different approach than the other AR projects. This one was kind of a scavenger hunt of sorts. It has diamonds similar to the ones from The Sims in each scene that you click on to get information. And they're numbered, so you go in order through each one and you move on to the next scene, or you can skip ahead or behind. And it also provides some multimedia pictures, audio, and resources at the end. And one thing I really liked is how some of the uh, avatars um, were colored after the colors in the flag, the pride flag. So what's happening here? TJ. Oh, um, this would be, that was a picture of Harvey Milk talking to some people. Uh, he was assassinated in, I believe it was 1978. Um, also assassinated along with the mayor of San Francisco by a disgruntled city councilman and largely considered to be a pretty big loss for the LGBT community. Right. And then um, we had a, a scene that was in, um, that, that told about Matthew Shepard. We just kind of skipped over it a little bit. And, and who was he? And physical violence uh, he was the victim of a hate crime in 1998, the year I was born. Uh, two men that he met in a bar actually convinced him to get in a truck with them. And he thought that they were going to just go do whatever. And then they ended up driving out to the middle of nowhere, robbed him, killed him. And well, he wasn't quite dead. They burned him alive and he ended up dying of his injuries later after he was tied to a fence post. And then we wind up uh, in Washington, D.C. in one of these scenes, and what happened in Washington? Washington, D.C., well, is largely the center of the entire country's LGBT rights. It's where marriage equality was legalized. Um, it's also the center of the country's military, which is a big deal thanks to the don't ask, don't tell policies. It was slow progress. At first it was more, you can't be gay and be in the military at all. Then came don't ask, don't tell, where you couldn't say anything about it, but you could do it, you could be gay per se under the radar. And eventually in 2011 that was finally repealed, allowing lesbian and gay and bisexual people to serve openly in the military. Excellent, excellent. Um, so what was the hardest part about creating your project, TJ, because you had a lot going on here? Uh, hardest part? Probably trying to get everything to work, as it turns out, made a technological mistake pretty early on um, in terms of uh, some pairing up of objects in the scene that then affected things later, made it a little finicky, and when tr we tried to correct it later, it warped the entire scenes and started messing with the dimensions of them. So that was a hard thing there. Um, also trying to keep the uh, size of the entire project low. The file size was another big issue. It, at first, before we started downloading stuff from the asset store in Unity, which is where you can get all sorts of pre-built 3D models, um, including those buildings aside from the one in the middle there, the other two are pre-built models. And they do not take up much file size at all and they're easy for a phone to render. So that was another big thing. And then we also had to figure out how to add in some more movement into it, whether to add videos what, or to add animations of people, and if so, what would represent each scene and how much is too much or too little, really. Right. 
And, and this is a question for all of you. Um, I know this is your first time doing something like this, but with practice, if you were doing this all the time as a producer for a, uh, a news company or if you were in a PR company, is this something you could turn out regular features? Is this something that, you know, maybe not daily, but is this something that instead of doing a multimedia project, you know, once a month, a big multimedia project, is this something that you could incorporate and can be part of the, the daily or monthly ebb and flow of some news organization? Can I take this? Yeah, go ahead, Kate. Well, so I would say that was the benefit of our app was really the, the easy ability to use the model of here's a uh, uh, terrain plane, here's an object that you care about and you tell a story about it. And you can't build a new app every week, but if you have a model, it would be very easy to build out. Um, when in the process of making our, our layers for our app, it was the process got a lot easier as time went on because you had your you had your terrain and you already know like okay, I have to be under this many tries. And the more that we completed one scene, the easier it was to kind of replicate that and have it, uh, you know, become something new in another scene. So I feel like with enough time, um, we actually did look at the New York Times as like AR um, projects for inspiration, the fact that they would like create these things, and not quite regularly, but maybe like every few months or so. Um, I can see this becoming, especially with more students uh, turning into journalists that know how to do this, um, becoming a more regular feature, especially when accompanying large stories where we need a little bit more um, interact, uh, we need a little bit more interactivity, we need a little bit more empathy, something that AR, um, the experience of AR specifically can give. And the same for, for news games. I mean, is this something that you could see um, could, could be done on a semi-regular basis within a news organization or a media company? Definitely, especially if you have a good team that all knows that and everyone knows how to produce something like that. When you, if you work together, you can definitely accomplish it. And I would say even within a month, you could pull off a great game. And as you do it more and more, you can narrow that time down. For sure, for sure. Well, at this point, I wanted to open it up to the audience to see if you have any questions for myself or the students uh, and the alumni here. And if so, um, we're putting a mic um, right there in the center. You can come on up and ask your questions to us um, or find out a little bit more about the technology we used, about the uh, formatting, any of that. Come on, don't leave me hanging. What do, somebody's got to have a question. Yes, thank you. Um, when you were talking about the witch and yours, oh, with, so I'm sorry. Um, I'm not. Sh did it come in like a package that you had to add the code of that into? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Because it's, yes. it's uh, super cool, but I'm slightly confused. Um, are you talking about how we managed to create the uh, our models? Yeah, or? like where you saw the witch with the green face and the witch mm -hmm. hat. Yeah. Where was that, and then how did you change it? So that was in the that was in Turbo Squid, which is kind of like an asset store um, that's separate from Unity. Um, with these models, so have you ever played like Sims, like designed your own character in like a video game or something like that? Kind of. Or like those classic like Bratz dolls games, like from 07. I love those. Um, but basically, it came in a package, and um, that asset was just the, the whole package itself. The pointy hat, the green skin, that was all in one. And we realized that we couldn't change any specific aspect of it, which meant that we had to create something entirely new, like make a new body and actually like design the clothes ourselves and place it on there. So it was a lot of, it was basically like, instead of buying something from the store, you had to hand make it. But in a game, in AR. I know this might sound weird, but is it an online store where you like buy the wolf and then you 
by the yes. switch and <laughs> like the house. We use the Unity uh, game engine. There's Unity and there's something called Unreal Engine. And, and Unity has a asset store that you can download free assets. Even if you need bricks to put on a house, you can get those. If you need trees, if you need um, a certain other assets for your content. Um, and then there are online places where you can go and download this. Some of them are free and some of them are very expensive. If you wanted a very realistic looking model of President Trump, for example, like a really realistic one, it might cost you uh, $1,500, $2,000 or something that's like a re uh, very detailed um, model of the, of the White House that's going to cost you money. But what these students were able to do is to create these avatars themselves. We, there's a, a program, Fuse and Mixamo, pull those in, but then you have to create create the clothes, you have to create a lot of the other um, parts of it to make it look realistic because as, you know, as journalists, we're trying to be as realistic as possible. So there's some massaging that goes on where you're utilizing a lot of the skills that you get in your online media classes, um, Blender, Photoshop, you know, different things like that. Uh, to put it all together. So just creating some of these assets that might take, um, you know, like a week. Um, in, they're in the lab two days a week, so it might take two days to create uh, two or three assets in a way that really looks the way they want them to look and not be cheesy um, because you don't want people to get turned off uh, from a serious subject by using assets that look more playful or look like they belong in some kind of fantasy, you know, um, first person shooter game. You're not going for that look, you're going for something that's a little different. Gotcha. Thank you guys. All right, thanks. Yes, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, were there any other challenges uh, thinking of uh, working with Unity? And since I'm assuming that most of them have, this is their first experience with the engine, I'm assuming. So were there like any notable challenges besides maybe like the asset creation, which you talked about before? So Unity uses coding. And if you've never worked with code before, it's very finicky. If you leave off a semicolon, your whole code won't work, and it's very frustrating. I'm sure we all <laughs> know what I'm talking about. But as frustrating as it is, when you finally get something working, it's one of the most rewarding feelings, and you feel really powerful because you just created something out of nothing. Right. Well, and one thing I can say with the freshmen particularly coming in is that you all are, are taking the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. C-sharp is, is similar to JavaScript. There are some similarities there. So if you were to come into the lab or if you were to download Unity, you can get the free version and, and sort of figure out how to do some of this stuff. It, you'll see that there are some similarities to what you're learning in your, um, your, your grammar for journalists or your coding for journalists uh, class. So it, it's, it's something that's doable. The other thing about Unity is that they have an amazing community out there. Um, they have a manual that is interactive. If you're looking, trying to figure out how to, you know, uh, launch a new scene on, uh, on a wake, as soon as you come to a new scene, it'll play music, it'll do something else. There's so much information and documentation that'll walk you through how to do that. And there are people that you can ask people who do YouTube videos, people who have Udemy uh, videos that you might pay 10 bucks for one of their tutorials, but they're always willing to jump in and help with uh, a problem. Um, Unity uh, is sort of like apps on the App Store where they're, it's always being updated. So just since December, they've uh, done two releases, but they're adding more and more because people use Unity uh, to create movies. Um, you know, Pixar is in there. You have a lot of the uh, major um, film companies, animation companies that use Unity. So it's not just for gamers. Um, so it has a lot of different parts to it. Uh, lighting and, and some scenes that you can make that look so realistic that you're ready to, you know, to, to um, go ahead and launch it as a Hollywood movie. You can. It's just really a beautiful but complex um, piece of software. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. The best part about um, learning through code um, has actually helped make the syllabus. Before, there wasn't a coding class here at Cronkite. And so I was able to look at the syllabus before the first class. Um, first coding class was made for freshmen. And 
What I really like about Unity and being part of this lab, I had only a little bit of coding experience before. It was always about like, I, I learned my basics of coding through really like awful fan fiction websites. But learning that basic HTML, or, uh, learning how to do um, CSS and then moving on to JavaScript, even though you may not um, pursue anything towards gaming, those skills that you learn when you're coding, you can take with you to a lot of different, like, different frontiers because it's the same elements. And so even if you have zero knowledge whatsoever, the fact that all of this learning, um, learning material is free and it's out there and you can learn it at home and you can learn it in, like, while you're making it as you go, um, it's really helpful and very essential nowadays in your toolbox as a journalist. Now, I, I know that, you know, you all are pursuing different paths um, in case you're planning to go to law school, right? You've been accepted to a couple of them. Congratulations. Um, you know, do you see ever using this uh, if you're as a lawyer or to explain complex issues, you know, moving forward? So th that was actually something that came up in discussion a few times with uh, a couple other um, faculty members of the, of the new media lab was how we could push this further. And even um, recently I've seen mock like crime scene uh, AR videos. Um, so there's definitely a future of AR in all aspects of life, not necessarily just journalism or media more generally, but but really everywhere. So yeah. I do, I do see myself using it in the future. <laughs> Good. Yeah, great, great. I mean, architecture, design, um, you know, IKEA and some of these uh, uh, furnishing stores, they have it where you can, you know, uh, put a, a sofa or a chair or a dining room set in your living room to see how it will look before you go out and purchase it. And when you look at online retailing to be able to try out something in terms of the look and feel in your own apartment or your own house. That's something that's a real practical aspect. If you think about all of those assets and, the, and all of those uh, advertisements have to be made by an artist or someone who knows Unity. So this kind of opens up a lot of possibilities for future work and jobs for students, whether they're strictly in media or journalism or where they're segueing into some other aspect. Um, architects have really been using this because you can have a client walk through a, um, a, a build or, or a design where they can feel what it's like to be at the stove and how far you have to reach in order to get the spoon out of the drawer. You know, something that's really important. But if you're building a house in Arizona and you live in California, you may not be able to come back and forth and see everything. So people in every aspect of um, industry, they're looking at AR. Car the car industry has been using it for a long time uh, in aeronautics because you want people to put on AR glasses and have an overlay of where they need to uh, weld or, or, or drill or, or fasten things together you know, with spaceships and the shuttle and boats and all kinds of things because you don't want to make that mistake when it's going up into space. You want to be able to do all of that on the ground. Um, and the great thing about augmented reality more so than virtual reality is that you don't have to put a headset on your head. And I think that's the thing that's been holding back Oculus and HTC Vive and even PlayStation uh, virtual reality is that you have to put it on your head. The frame rates make a lot of people sick and nauseous. Um, whereas with augmented reality, you're using something that you already have in your pocket, your smartphone, your tablet. Uh, and then at CES, uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, a couple of companies were showing off their glasses that look more like, you know, the glasses that Case has on. So you just switch over into uh, AR mode and you're able to see a lot more enhancements rather than having to put, pick up something and put it on your head and, and uh, be tethered to a high-end computer. That was never going to work. Um, Companies like Magic Leap, which finally announced some of its new product, where they're making 
uh, they have this one virtual assistant called Micah that the virtual assistant you have on little goggles, but the virtual assistant looks as real as Nicole. Facial expressions, eyes, mouth, speaking patterns. So you look at the future and you think about, can we take that virtual assistant and turn it into a news anchor? Not to displace any of you, but to maybe have a virtual um, view of one of you. So if you're a news anchor, maybe I want you to come into my home and, and give me the top headlines. Um, or maybe I want to be able to take, take me to the scene of something monumental that happened. All of this is part of the future of storytelling, and it's just a matter of what can we imagine and then what can we put into place. Um, and I think these students showed that in 16 weeks, about five weeks of just learning the tools, and then another seven or eight weeks of just going for it, that they've been able to create some amazing work, um, work that I'm really proud of, and I hope you guys are proud of it as well. Any other questions? You wanna do it? You wanna learn? come to the New Media Innovation Lab when you're eligible. Um, by that time, we're gonna be doing holograms and you know, virtual glasses and all kinds of really super cool stuff. I mean, the sky's the limit. And as long as they keep making science fiction movies, I'll keep thinking of new stuff to do. So it's all gonna be cool. Thank you.